Good. So, so it's a it's a big pleasure to be here. So thank you very much for the invitation and for the presentation, uh, Yasir. And uh, okay, today I will talk a little bit about uh, computational chemistry and give a couple of examples. That's something that we have done in our institute. I hope you I hope you can hear me correctly. If so, let me start by saying that uh, okay. So this is so um, we are located in uh, in the country of Spain. So this is uh, in so my the Institute of Computational Chemistry and Catalysis in which I work is uh, located in the University of Girona and Girona is a city, a small city, 100,000 inhabitants, 100,000 inhabitants close to the French border and also to the Mediterranean Sea, so of course. Let me start by uh, a short introduction to computational chemistry. I mean, not many equations, just uh, some general ideas. So you know that uh, in, general, in many, many cases we say that we are a theoretical and computational chemists, and, but there is a distinction between both. So theoretical chemists are the ones that, let's say, develop the mathematical equation. So they find that they try to, to, to uh, let's say, if there is a, a, chemical pro, a chemical problem that has to be solved, they try to put them in mathematical terms, in, in equations. Let's suppose that you have the charge, charge transfer reaction and you want to study it. Then you, you, there is someone that, uh, provides the equations, right? And in this case, it's the Marcus equation, for instance. Then there is the computational chemistry. When you have the mathematical equations, you make, um, you translate these equations into computer programs, and you can use these programs to solve chemical problems, right? And uh, so this is the computational chemistry. A part of the computational chemistry is the computational quantum chemistry. Yeah? So today, basically, I will show you examples of computational quantum chemistry. And this is the Quantum chemistry, the computational chemistry that uses the that solves the Schrodinger equation for uh, trying to understand chemical problems, right? And then there is the Apinitio quantum chemistry, and this is a part of computational quantum chemistry that do not include any empirical parameters or experimental data. Mm -hmm. So this is, let's say, the different branches of computational chemistry. So. Um, a model, when, we, when you, we use computational chemistry, we apply a model. For instance, we apply the Hartree-Fock method, let's suppose. And this is a system of equations and approximations that are used to determine the energy of a molecule. So you can, in general, use different models depending on your problem. Uh, and these models produce results of different accuracy. So in general, the most accurate models are the ones that are more, that has highest price, highest cost, computational cost, and then you can apply them only in a small systems, for instance. So depending on the size of the system and different variables, you choose one model or the other. And there is this trade-off between accuracy and computational time. So the better you, the better the accuracy, the, the, the higher the computational time. Basically, there are two type, two main types of models, those that, use the Schrodinger equation, so you solve the Schrodinger equation, and those do, that do not. So let me tell you, so this is the two types of models. So in, for instance, the Apinitio models are ones that use a Schrodinger equation. So they solve the Schrodinger equations, in this case, without no experimental data. You can, you do several approximations, but you do not include experimental data. And these are, these are called Apinitio, right? And then you have the semi-empirical. In the case of semi-empirical, you also solve the Schrodinger equation, but in this case, you introduce experimental parameters to the equation. So some integrals, for instance, are taken from experimental results. And so kind of they are parameterized. Mm -hmm. And finally, you have this uh, molecular mechanics. In this case, you do not solve the Schrodinger equation. You simply consider the bonds as a kind of a spring with a, um, with a um, force constant and, and so on. So you consider the bonds like that. You consider the, the bendings as a kind of uh, also the, the spring and so on. So this, and they are parameterized. Uh, so the problem with this model, let's say, is that you can not easily break a bone eh, because they use the harmonic approximation. So you have a potential that simply increases when you increase the length of the bone. So it, you never, you can, in principle, you can, well, in principle, you cannot use this model to 
understand chemical reactivity, but, but they are useful for other many things. Okay, so Apinitio, eh? this means this is translated from Latin and means from first principles, so meaning that you don't use experimental data. And then at this Apinitio level, you have the Hartree-Fock approximation, which is probably the simplest. Apinitio calculations, correlation, electron correlation, what we call electron correlation is not included there. Then you have the density functional theory and the calculation that I will show you are using the density functional theory is probably one of the most used nowadays. It was not this situation maybe 30 years ago, but now it's, it's almost all computational results are obtained with density functional theory. Then you have this molar plastic perturbation theory, and you have also the configuration interaction and couple cluster methods. And so the, the, the most accurate are the last ones, but, uh, but okay, mm, you can apply them only to small molecules. And you see the reason why. Yeah? So this is um, piece of molecular mechanics. You see, you can, you can mm, make calculations with one, you, the number of maximum a number of atoms. So you can reach 1 million atoms in your system and still you can make calculations with that. But the accuracy is less than 20 kcal per mole. Mm -hmm. Then if you go to semi-empirical methods, the number, the number maximum, the maximum number of atoms is 500. Mm -hmm. And then the, the accuracy is about 10 kcal per mole. And then for DFT is 500, and then you have uh, accuracy of 5 kcal per mole. And then if you go to copper cluster, for instance, you can only make calculations with 30 atoms. More than that is probably takes too much time. But then the accuracy is quite good. It's about 1 kcal per mole. So at the end, it's a kind of trade-off between accuracy and uh, size of the system. So depending on the size of the system, you can use one method of the other. Just to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about 1 million atoms, so the cell of a living organism ha has about uh, one million atoms. So you are far far from uh, from having the por the possibility to to let's say to compute the cell eh, to 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 obtain the, to 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 see how the cell evolves with a classical force field with this, this molecular mechanics. But okay, so we are moving forward to this direction, eh, and you can probably already now simulate a, a, a small organelle in, in the cell. Okay, this is more or less the same that I, I told you before. So you have the here, you have the time that you need to compute one molecule. So the, these are different examples. For instance, this is methane, benzene, tryptophan, and so on. And these are the different methods, right? And you see uh, that this, um, <clears throat> here is the, the, the calculations, you have, you have the calculations running for one week. So you can compute all these kind of things is fine. So for instance, you can obtain um, ATP with Hartree-Fock of DFT. This is something that you can do it, but not probably with copper cluster because it takes uh, too long, eh? many, many years. So it's, well, it's this kind of situation that you have to, when you choose your method, it depends basically on the size of the, of the molecules. So this is the, this is a basic, a basic set that uh, is considered here is 631 G star. And you see these are the different primitive basis functions. So, well, in the benzene, you have more or less 150 primitive functions. Okay, so what you get from a computational um, result, I mean, when we use one of these models in general, what you get is the energy of, for a given geometry. Yeah? This is, for instance, a diatomic molecule. And this is the, the distance between the two atoms. And let's suppose that you have this distance here, so you can compute the energy and you get this value here. Then you change the, the distance to here and then you get this value here with your method. Eh? So then you can see how the energy changes when you change the geometry. And when you have enough points, you can depict the potential energy surface, which is this function here. It's a function of the energy um, with respect to the uh, coordinates, in this case, the, the distance between the two atoms, right? And then when you have this, you can determine which geometries are the stable ones. So the molecule uh, is stable in this position here, in the minimum, right? So this is, in this position is stable because if you move the molecule in one direction or another, so the molecule tends to vibrate, but 
to come back to the original situation. So this is in a stable, a stable geometry. It's a, stable, a geometry in which um, the, if the, there is no any force applying there, then the molecule stays at, at that point. Mm -hmm. And you can also, let's say, uh, start from a given geometry and then uh, look what um, take compute what is called the, the gradient or the force and uh, follow this gradient in order to reach the minimum of the molecule. So you do, do not, you in principle in, in these uh, programs, you do not need to have uh, the full potential energy surface just to have an initial geometry and the programs has the, the mathematical equations to arrive to the minima, to the stable points, but not only the minima, but also the transition states. So you can, com you can compute the energy of the react and intermediates, transition state products. You know everything about the reaction, right? If the, if the instead of like having a, a, a unique um, coordinate, like in the case of the, the diatomic molecule, you have a more complicated molecule, then you can depict the potential energy surface in as a function of two coordinates, and then the third coordinate is the energy, and you have things like that, right? And here you have the reactants, and here you have the pro one product A, here you have product B, and you see the, the path that goes, you can compute or you can find the path that goes from A to B and to, from, from the reactants to A and from the reactants to B. You can de determine the transition state and you can know if the reaction will produce A or will produce B, for instance. Eh? So it's so basically you have all information you need about a molecule or about the reaction is, is already, you can find it in the potential energy surface because you have all, not only the potential energy surface of the ground state, but also of the different excited states. So you can have, you have information also about what happens in the excited states. So I think this is a very powerful method uh, to to analyze um, to analyze a chemical reaction. So then you can also determine how the energy changes with external perturbations. For instance, an electric field. I will tell you about this later. You can find the thermochemistry, so the difference between products and reactants. You can find reaction path, how the the, the molecule move when going from reactants to products and energy barriers. This is very important to get then reaction rates. So all this information is included in the in the calculations, and and also many properties of the molecule. So you can know the all electrical properties, type of moment, polarizabilities, hyperpolarizabilities, and so on. You you get the energy orbital energy level so the energy of the homo the lumo and so on the ionization energy the electron affinity the electron density distribution the electrostatic potential vibrational frequency so you have the you you have the ir spectra you get elect, you can get electronic excitation energy so the uv spectra NMR chemical chief, I mean, any type of spectra uh, can be computed nowadays and compared with experimental results. So I think it's a, a very pow powerful um, method and um, most of the current studies, I mean, they combine both. They, you have uh, experimental results, but then let's say you have, um, you have them rationalize it or explain it with uh, theoretical calculations. So this is the most common uh, type of papers that we have probably today. And uh, I will show you two examples of this computational chemistry. The, uh, the computational chemistry of these two examples uh, has, has been done with uh, this density functional theory methods, right? So I will show you an example of a reaction, uh, the determination of a reaction mechanism, and then the, uh, the charge transfer in a, in a, in a fluid. Um, so let me start with the first one. And uh, before that, uh, before going to the, the example that I will show you, let me tell you that there is this reaction. This is called the Menchukin reaction. And this is the a reaction between a tertiary am amine, which is this one here, and an alkylalite, which is this one here, right? And then what you get is a quaternary ammonium sal. Hmm? So this is... Um, this the typical Menchukin reaction. They were studied many years ago in 1819. And what Menchukin found is that this reaction works quite well in polar solvents, but uh, it doesn't work when you use solvents that uh, do not have enough polarity. polarity. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, okay, this is a paper that we wrote many years ago 
when I was doing the PhD. And we, let's say, uh, model a Menchukin reaction taking ammonia, so the most simple tertiary amine, uh, or well, in this case, it's not tertiary amine, it's simply ammonia, uh, but it's an example of its approximation to a tertiary amine. At that time, we don't have uh, com large computational resources. Then we took this bromine, methyl bromine, and then you see this is the final product. So you have bromine on one hand, and then you have this um, quaternary ammonium salt. So this is uh, when we we computed this um, result. What we think is this potential energy surface. So now this reaction coordinate is the difference between the carbon bromide distance, so this distance here, and the nitrogen carbon distance. So this means that when you are in the reactant site, you have negative values of the reaction coordinate. And in the in this situation here, in the products, so these are the products, you have you have values of the carbon bromide that are larger than the nitrogen carbon, and this is a positive quantity. So this is a way simply to represent the, the reaction in just one single reaction coordinate, right? And this is what we found. So there is, so ammonia approach first the methyl bromine, and then you have an, a, a very, an intermediate that is, I mean, is stable, but by very few kcal per mole. Then we have the transition state, which is this one that I depicted here. Then you have a kind of intermediate from the products. And if finally, if you want to separate the products, if you in this intermediate, you have an interaction between bromine and this methyl ammonium. If you want to separate the products, then you need a lot of energy and the, the, the system, the reaction is quite endothermic. So this is what happens in this reaction. So now what we, this is in the gas phase, right? And then what we saw is that if you consider several solvents, then the energy decreases and at, at the end, the, 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 the reaction is quite exothermic. But also, if you include a, 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 an electric field, let's suppose that you put an electric field in the reaction, what you do with this electric field, this electric field shows the direction of the positive charge, right? So what does this electric field is to help the positive charge to move to this position and the negative charge to this position here, right? So this is an electric field. If we apply an electric field of this uh, intensity, the reaction is almost thermoneutral. If we increase a little bit the, 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 the intensity, then the reaction is quite exothermic. This shows you that the electric fields help in some reactions. In some reactions, they, are, they, they, are, they can be used as a catalysis. So uh, we are saying that uh, this, uh, this electric field can catalyze the reaction. So what um, you do basically in these computer programs to include this electric field is simply you have the Hamiltonian, right? And, and then you have the different um, um, operators, so kinetic energy, electron-electron repulsion, electron-nuclear attraction, nuclear-nuclear repulsion, and then you add the effect of the electric field. This is dipole moment multiplied by the electric field, right? And then you solve the Schrodinger equation and you get an exact solution. But what we found in this uh, very recently, in this paper that I show you here, in this paper here, what we found is that we can obtain an approximate solution, but much faster, much, uh, I mean, we need much less time. So it is based in the in the Taylor expansion. So remember in Taylor expansion, what we have is that if you know in for a function, you know the value of the function at certain point, the first derivative, second, third one, and so on, you can compute the value of the function at any point. And this is exact as far as you put all possible uh, derivatives here, right? If you make, if you cut this expansion at certain point, then it's an approximation, right? So this is what we did with the electric field. So then uh, let's suppose that you, we know the energy and we know also the derivative of the energy with respect to, uh, to the electric field at the free field um, situation. So this is the dipole moment, the polarizability, hyperpolarizability, and so on. What we can do is an, an, an Taylor expansion of the energy with respect to the electric field. So we have the, the energy at the field-free situation without any field. And then we have here the first derivative, which is this term here, multiplied by the field and the second derivative, which is this one here, the polarizability and so on. And so 
the good point here is that we do not need to solve the Schrodinger equation every time that we want to know what is the energy in a given electric field. We simply have to know is the, what are the values of the dipole moment, polarizabilities, hyperpolarizabilities, in the case of the field-free solution, so without electric field. So we make only one calculation and then you, we have the idea of how the electric field evolves by just applying this equation here, right? So it's a very fast way to determine the effect of the electric field, basically. So it's an approximated, an approximated way because usually we cut in the second term. So we, we keep just the polarizability. In some cases, we have included the hyperpolarizability and so on, but we have seen that just by including the, the polarizability, you get quite good results. And then we apply this approximation to this reaction here. So this is a one three dipolar cycle addition between phenyl diazomethan methane, which is molecule here, and methoxyethene, which is this molecule here. And then you get these four type of molecules. Right, so it's not the reaction is not uh, very selective. Let's say you can get these four types of, of possible products, and this result from the different approximations of the methoxyethene to the phenyl diazomethane that you can see here. So DXO is obtained when you approach in that way. So the, the interaction is in that way, or DXO prime in that way, and so on, mm? and the endo and the endo prime, and these are the the. Um, these are the, the barriers of the reaction. So the reaction has a barrier of about 20 kcal per mole, more or less. Um, and this is the barriers, for instance, when you have a zero electric field. So without electric field, you get that the, the most important product is the green one. So the exo, this one here. Then it comes the uh, red one, so the endo, and then the exo prime and endo prime, right? So this is a zero electric field. Now you apply an electric field in that direction, right? In that direction. Mm -hmm. And what you get is that <clears throat> you see here that, for instance, if you have negative electric fields, now the most important product is the endo one. Then at certain electric field is the exo, exo uh, endo prime. Then is the exo prime and then it comes the exo, right? And this is what you see here. For instance, in, in the field zero, you have the endo prime that uh, if you increase a little bit the electric field, then you have the exo prime. And finally, what you get is the endo prime. So now we compute not only what, what uh, in that direction, the electric field, but, but also in the x direction, which is the direction coming to our, to, to the screen, right? And then here you have depicted the, the two possible, the combination of the two possible electric fields. And what you see here is that depending on the electric field you choose, you can get the, any of the four possible um, uh, isomers, right? So it's a way, so the, 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 the electric field not only catalyzes the reaction, you see that depending on the electric field, you have barriers that at, at zero, the, the barrier is about 20 kcal per mole, but if you increase the electric field, it could be 17. So you, you can increase if you want the velocity of the reaction, but also you increase the selectivity. So you, depending on the electric field you put, you can get any of these possible isomers. Let me tell you that this is, of course, theoretical work, but experimentally we have also, um, we have some, some, uh, some, results let me see I, I don't know why now it is it has been it is not moving so let me see if uh, just let me wait and let me see if it's sorry the the screen is now not well we have to wait a little bit but let me tell you that experimentally you can do experimental uh, now at this moment we can you can do experimental um, measures of this type of selectivity and catalysis using what is called a tip of the an scanning tunneling mi microscope. And this is what I want to show you in the next next uh, transparency. I don't know if, oh yeah, now it's it comes here. So you see there is the, the surface and then you can put in the surface, you can put a, a this is a diels alder reaction. And it's not a the one three di dipolar reaction, but this was published in Nature some years ago. So you have a dienophile di uh, here, you have a diene in the tip of an STM, 
and then you approach the two molecules and you apply the different electric fields. And depending on the electric field, you get one isomer or the other. So this is something that you can check. Eh? So this is something that you cannot produce industrially. You cannot use it industrially yet, but it's something that has been checked experimentally. And I think this is very interesting. So let me move to the next uh, next topic, and this is about the charge transfer in fluorines. And let me tell you that uh, okay, uh, this is um, uh, I mean this charge transfer is used in 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 solar cells, for instance, in organic solar cells. Eh? And let me tell you that these solar cells are in I mean I mean uh, will be for sure important in the future because I mean uh, <clears throat> I mean the the sun. The, the, the energy that we get in the sun in one hour in the whole Earth is enough to, to uh, provide the energy that is consumed by humans in an entire year. Uh, so, so this is, um, I mean, this is uh, something, I mean, uh, it seems that it could be the future of at least, or at least an important part of the energy that we collect in the future or the, that we need, the humanity needs, will come from the sun. So this is how the cells work, more or less. Um, and very simple, but just tell you that most of the solar cells are based on silicon. But the problem of silicon um, solar cells is that they are uh, they they to to fabricate them you need a lot of energy, and then you have also environmental problems. So this could be solved if we use organic materials in what is called dye synthesizer solar cells. In this case, you have you should have a donor and acceptor of electrons. So because you have you have to separate electrons and holes, right? So positive and negative charges. So the negative charges travel to the anode and the positive charge travel to the cathode and then you get this ring current. So you have, you have, you should have molecules that provide electrons and other molecules that get these electrons. So you have a separation of charge. There are, there are many of these organic molecules that can play this role. Still, the efficiencies of these cells are not as high as those of silicon, but they have other, other interesting properties like the ones that you can make flexible and cheap devices. And some of them, they are transparent, so you can put in windows if you want and you collect the energy of the sun there. Okay, so there are more or less, uh, in, when you have this organic material, you can assemble this organic material in two different ways. One, call, one of the solar cells are called bilateral junction solar cells. In this case, basically what you do is to simply mix the two materials. One material that provides electrons, so they are donors, and usually these materials are these, uh, um, uh, these polymers that you can see here, they are, they are good donors. And then the acceptor of electrons, they are usually materials that come from fluorines, and made from fluorines. And then you simply mix them. You have here more or less what you, you can see here. So the fluorines are the, are the, Let's say the the yellow part, the the polymers are the 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 red part, and okay, there is some the the energy arrive, there is some excitation, and then there is a creation of a hole, and an electron. So the hole travels to the anode, and the electron travels to the cathode, and then you have this this energy. So this is one possibility. Another possibility is to use molecular heterojunctions. In this case, what you use, you have the acceptor here, which is usually fluorine, and then you have the donor attached covalently to the fluorine. So in that way, you control, you, you, is a way in which you have a better structural con control and charge mobility timing. So it's, uh, it's probably a good idea to move to well, at least to, to start studying molecular interjunctions. Hmm? So how, how this uh, works? Eh? So how do you get this charge transfer separation? So basically, you have initially from the sun a local excitation. So when the light hits a fluorine diet, in many cases, there is a local excitation from the OMO minus one, which is this orbital that you, you see here, to the, uh, to the LUMO. Right, so this is so the, the the you have the excitation to an excited state, and then there is a um, almost um, immediate or, or very fast relaxation to the lowest lying excited state. This is a local excited state, and this is this corresponds to the transition to the of to the movement of one electron from the OMO to the LUMO, and then you have what is called an exciton. So it, your material has been excited, right? Then you have now the material excited, so you are in this position, 
And what you have, it's a charge transfer. So the charge transfer should be of lower energy than the local excited state in usually, or close in energy. You have a charge transfer from the homo to the homo minus one. And what you get in this case is a separation of charge. So the, the donor has a positive charge and the acceptor has a negative charge, right? And finally, what you have is that one electron from the LUMO goes to the LOMO, and then you recover the initial ground state. So what you want to have a very good uh, diet eh, for solar cells, you want an efficient local excitation. So that uh, you want to absorb as light as possible, high absorption. And then you want to have a charge separation fast. So you have the two, uh, the hole and the electron separated. And then a charge recombination, which is the last, pro last process, this one here, the charge recombination, you want to be as low. Eh? This is ideally the material that you need. Okay. We studied these uh, systems, which are fullerenes, and then you have a cycloparafenylene. So this is a, a, a different benzene that they are joined to make a kind of ring. Eh? So this is not a, a covalent interaction between the fullerene and the and the cycloparafeniline, but uh, the interaction is strong enough. So you see the numbers here. This is uh, simply fluorine with a lithium inside, lithium plus inside. The interaction is so important that you have this material. Is, uh, this is a table. It's like if, if you have a covalent bond. So we decided to study the charge transfer in this particular case. Let me tell you that these cycloparafenilines are kind of, I mean, you can, um, are part of a, of the, a nanotube. It's a kind of shorter slides of the carbon nanotube. Yeah? And then you can have cycloparafenylines of different sizes, from 5 to 18 or something like that. So what we, for C60, the, the best one, or the one that, that uh, makes better complexes, more stable complexes, is the 10 CPP, right? So then you have here the energy, the homo and lumo of the 10 CPP, the homo and lumo of C60, and then when you make, let's say, the complex, you see that the homo is basically the, the same homo that you have in the 10 CPP. And this is the, remember, this is the donor, the one that gives the electrons. And the LUMO is basically the, the LUMO of the C60, is the one that receives the electron. And the difference is 4.15 uh, EB. So now if you go to, and you put the lithium inside, lithium plus, uh, basically, what it happens is that all orbitals stabilize eh? because the positive charge stabilizes all molecular orbitals because it's more difficult to get one electron from some from a place where you have positive charge, and it's more easy or it gives it gives you more energy if you put one electron in this in this system. And because of that, the energy of the LUMO and the HOMO decreases is is placed in the same place. And now, but the 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 LUMO, which is in the in the C60, right, is the one that reduces more the energy. And you see that it's reduced about one EV from here to here. So the HOMO LUMO is reduced by one EV. So I would say that all orbitals are more or less one EV closer in energy when you put this lithium inside. Okay, so we have computed different excited states and we, we, we classified them as um, local excitation, when the charge separation is quite close to zero, transfer state when you have a, a large charge separation, so you have one electron and, and, a, and a hole separated by a long distance, and mix it in the case that you have intermediate charge separation. And this is what we get for the 10 CPP, this is in vacuum, we get a local excited state. So we study 60 vertical excitations. So I put here only four, but because they are the important ones. Eh? So this is the, the local excitation, the lowest one, and it is in the fluorine. It's, it is localized, the, this exciton in the fluorine. We have another one that is localized in the CPP host, but is higher in energy than one EV. Then we have the most absor absorptive transition, the one that has a larger um, um, strength, uh, absorption. So this is, um, this is located in the host. And finally, this is the charge transfer, right? And you see that the charge separation is close to one electron. So it's a charge transfer in this case. And you see that it's a little bit higher in energy than the energy of the lowest lying local excited state. And because of that, in principle, this, this is not um, 
probably the, the charge transfer is not very favorable because we need some uh, reduction of energy. When we you put it in the DCM, in the dichloromethane solution, then you get more or less the same except for the charge transfer that is specially stabilized. In this case, now, now the charge transfer is improved. So the more polar the solvent, the better for this charge transfer process. And this is, this is what we get. Uh, you see, this is the delta G, so it's the difference between the, the local excited state, this L, LE1, and the charge transfer state. And you see that the, the, the more polar the solvent, so when we go from this to this, the more polar the solvent, the lower the, the energy difference. And this is translated in a higher charge transfer um, rate. And this is good. Eh? Remember that the, we want to have a fast charge transfer rate. And we compute this uh, with this formula. This is the Marcus equation. So I know I do not go in details, but basically we, we compute with this formula here. Mm -hmm. So basically what we see is that the charge transfer occurs in nanosecond time scale in these systems. Now let's put the lithium inside. And we, if we put the lithium, you see that um, in the vacuum, you have more or less the same energies for the local excited state in the fluorine, in the host, and the most absorptive um, transition. And then for the charge transfer, you have much lower energy, which in principle is good eh, because we want to have this stabilized and why remember that remember that what i show you before is that the homolumo gap reduces by one eb so not only the homolumo gap but in general any excitation is um let's say is um any excitation that is not is in between um the cpp and the c60 is reduced by one eb and this is what we observe here so more or less one eb of difference and it's now the the the, the separation is much easier when we put the dcm so again, the local excitation does almost not change. And this is because there is, there is no, the molecule is not very polar. So the, the solvent does not make big changes except for the charge transfer. Yeah, for the charge transfer, you see that we, we observe here an, an stabilization of the charge transfer, which is the normal situation, but here it's, it's a destabilization. I will try to, to, to explain that. Here you have the, the orbitals, how they look like. So the local excitation, remember that we have a local excitation first, uh, and we, we, we call it local because it occurs in a, in a certain part of the molecule, in this case in fluorine, so it goes from here to here. Then we have the local excitation in the cycloparaphenylene. This was higher in energy, so less interesting, let's say, but this is the local excitation that we have in the cycloparaphenylene. And this is the charge separation, right? So the, you go from the homo of the of the system, which is the 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 ohm of the CPP to the C60, and now we have a charge separation. So the C, the CPP gets positively charged, and the fluorine gets negatively charged. And okay, this is uh, what we have in general. If we have uh, t the 10 CPP and C60, if we comp if we co compute the energy difference, or we compute the energy, sorry, the energy of the excited state charge transfer excited state. So this becomes less and less when the um, when the polarity of the solvent increases. So you have more solvent, then the charge transfer, it's, it becomes uh, favorable, or more and more easy, easier. And okay, this is what you have in general. So, but if we go to this other system with the lithium inside, what you have is that the other way, it increases, why? Okay, we plot the electrostatic potential, and this the electrostatic potential shows that in the in the case of the lithium system, when you are in the ground state, you see the fluorine is positively charged, and this stabilizes quite a lot this fluorine. Now you go to the charge separated state. Now you have the CPP is positively charged and the C60 is negatively charged. But as a whole, the, all together, lithium and C60, this is uh, neutral. And because of that, it's less stabilized by the solvent. So the solvent stabilizes better the ground state than the charge transfer, st charge transfer state. And because of that, um, then you have this, what is called this ipsochromic um, effect. Eh? So this means that the ipsochromic chief, it means that, um, okay, uh, by, going to a more polar solvent, the, the, the energy of the charge transfer state 
um, increases instead of decreasing, which is what you expect. And now uh, let me show you the, the, the final results about, about this, um, this system. So again, I have, uh, well, I have some problems to move the, the screen from, so we have, we have to wait a couple of minutes, but let me tell you that um, what we observe in this, um, in this case is that the, the, the charge transfer process is much faster when we have the lithium plus inside. And this is something that we have proof uh, theoretically, but not experimentally. So someone should have this um, analysis experimentally and see uh, if we are right or not. So sorry for the, for the delay, it is not moving now, but I hope it will do in a few seconds. So I'm basically, this is what uh, I wanted to tell about this example. So just to finish very briefly. So what could be next in computational chemistry, just to probably try to, um, uh, well, to, to give you uh, incentive to, 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 to follow these studies. So I will show you some examples in which I think the, our contribution as computational chemistry could be important in the, in the, in the near future. I don't know what, oh, let's see if it's, maybe I have, to, I will have to close and let me wait on some seconds. If it doesn't work, then I will close it and. Yeah. Okay, yeah. in the meantime, uh, could you please guide us, Professor? If yeah. We use any other functional instead of chem B3 leap or any other okay. long range functional? Yeah. Or, uh, long separated functional. What will be the difference? For example, if we use PBE0 instead of that? Yeah, right. I mean, um, so sorry for. Uh, yes. Uh, in principle, I mean, most of the range corrected functionals, like, I don't know, B97. Um, or omega B97 or this kind of functionals. I mean, they, they, we, we found that they, they, they produce very good results. Eh? So, so, I mean, the, the, what you have to do is to use range corrected functionals here, right? So this is, so the geometry, you can do the geometry in any of functional in the case we use believe. And uh, I mean, if you want to compute, char, um, let's say, um, excited states and especially the charge transfer states, a range corrected functional is needed. So in our, in our we did a benchmark and the best functional for uh, to, in our system was CAM B3, but you can use omega B94 or, or, or 97 or any other. What is probably not so good is to use um, cor, um, uh, normal GGAs. So I don't know, can you see my screen now? Do you have a table in the screen or maybe not? Yes, it's visible okay. now. Okay, okay. So yeah, simply this is was was the end. And uh, just to show you that, that in the case of benzonide trial, we have we are in the picosecond regime. So the, the charge transfer takes place in the picosecond regime. In the case you have the lithium plus inside. So this system in principle should be should work well, should work better in the case you go to, um, you want to apply them for solar cells. Okay, this is about this, uh, as I told you, we have a, a batochromic shift, with, this is the normal one, in the case of uh, C60 at, with 10 CPP, and the ipsochromic shift, if you put the lithium inside. And what's next, eh, right? What we, what, we, what we can, what we can, uh, what can be the next uh, step of computational uh, computational chemistry? I mean, this is something that has been is already. There are people already working on that. So this is single atom catalysis. So basically, you you have a metal surface. You put uh, several metals here, and you can have single atom atom on the surface. You can also have some clusters, and you can have uh, nanoparticles. And this uh, situation you have, and in this case, you have. Uh, very good catalysis. And this is something that computational chemistry should help in this case to try to understand why in some cases the nanoparticles are better than the single atom catalysis, in other cases it's the other way around and so on. We have also the batteries. Eh? This is very important um, thing that has to be improved. Eh? We have a battery in which uh, during the discharge, the, the lithium atoms 
move from the anode to the cathode. So this is a graph, graphene uh, sheets here, and you have here metal oxides, and then it moves that way. When you charge the battery, it goes the other way around. Eh? So this process, it, it always works. It already works. The, these lithium batteries are very good, but we, 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 we do not have too much lithium or enough lithium to have batteries for all cars and everything. Eh? So probably it will be, there is a need to change lithium by sodium or, or the metals, and also maybe to improve this, um, or this um, metal oxides or this graphene sheets in order to have this uh, movement of the lithium up and forth. Then we have this photocatalysis. In the case of photocatalysis, we have, for instance, semiconductor, like here, the tit lit um, titanium oxide, and then this absorbs the light, and by absorbing the light, the oxygen can tr be transformed in, in the in the radical O2 minus, and the water can lose the proton, and you get the radical OH. And with that, you can um, get rid of uh, organic pollutants. So it's a way to avoid pollution, right? Or you can also take the water and transform the water into hydrogen and oxygen. This is a very important process because from here you get from water, you get hydrogen and you can use hydrogen as a fuel, right? And and this is, so this is, would be very important. And I'm sure that computational chemists can help to improve this process. We have also the, 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 the problem of the, uh, climatic change. Eh? So uh, I have seen that in your in your class you have this uh, fan, probably because the there is uh, your, the temperature is relatively high, and and this is in part because of this uh, climate change, and we have to try to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, and this is a process that could work. That suppose we using photocatalysis, we can produce hydrogen, and with this hydrogen we can make them react with CO2 with certain maybe uh, what I showed you before, the single atom catalysis, and to produce methanol or olefin aromas and so on. So this is a process that I'm sure that in the future will be working, but uh, computational chemists can also help to make them more efficient. Then in, in the case of the solar cells, there is some, something that is relatively new and is interesting. There are some materials when you excite them, you produce this uh, excitation. This is a singlet excited state, uh, this local excited state that I showed you before. But there are some materials that when they are in contact with the ground state, they can transform this singlet excitation into two triplet excitations. This is called singlet fission. So the singlet is transformed into two, two triplet. And now you have two excited, two, from with one photon, you get two molecules excited, not in the singlet state, in the triplet state. But if the triplet state is high in energy than the charge transfer state, you can use this double excitation to get charge separation, right? So for with one photon, you get two electrons. In principle, this is, this should be, uh, I mean, this should increase the efficiency of the solar cells. This is something that this has been studying now, and it's important. Okay. All the de novo enzymes, so you know enzymes are very, very uh, efficient in catalyzing reaction, but they can do it only in certain conditions. So what do the, uh, the, um, the, the people in, in, in the lab is to change some characteristics of the enzyme. For instance, I don't know, can change alanine by, uh, uh, um, by acetosine or something like that. And, uh, and, and this is called direct pollution. So they change different amino acids and they try to find the enzyme that is especially stable in, and they can be used in industrial process. So at this moment, there are several um, drugs that are, are, are already made by enzymes. And this is a very important field. And in this field, I'm sure that computational chemistry has a lot to do because, I mean, there is a lot of work to make this experimentally, and there are many options. I mean, you can change many, many amino acids, right? Because there are plenty of amino acids here. So the computational design in this case is very efficient. It can help experimental pipot. And the same for the drug design. Yeah? So you, you have a, let's suppose you have a receptor or something that it doesn't work correctly and you want to, to, um, to put uh, some uh, ligand inside in order to make it ineffective, not working or something like that in that way. And then you have a Ligrand library, you have different different conformers and what you can do is with this molecular mechanics, you can put these molecules inside the, the active center and see which one 
uh, interacts better with the enzyme. And the ones that interact better, this, this can be done then prove experimentally and make a new, new drugs in that way. So I think there is a lot of, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there are many other situations in which you can apply chemistry in the future. And I think there is a bright, um, I mean, a future for computational chemistry. So I, um, so I encourage you to, to follow this, this path because I, I think you can, you can enjoy it. So thank you. I'm, I'm finished now. So I hope, hopefully I have, I, I don't know if I, it's too, I have taken too much time, hopefully not, but anyway, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Professor Mikul, for your valuable time and a very nice talk. It was really informative and I think it was um, intellectual. Students will get motivation, definitely.